Welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. My name is Guru Nishan. I was born and raised in this community, and um, I was inspired to start this podcast for several reasons, and I wrote out some intentions. So I'm going to read those before I introduce our guest for today's episode. Intention number one to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying, gaslighting, or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural misappropriation, and exploitation that permeates the teachings 3HO lifestyle, and overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. Number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy and other support as needed, draw your own conclusions and be critical thinkers rather than just blindly follow anyone. Remember that your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and support you. So today I wanna welcome um, uh, our guest for episode nine, um, Jimena Selling, born and raised in Mexico City. Um, By the age of 16, she moved into an ashram and adopted the 3HO lifestyle in 2002 changing her name to Dion. Became a yoga teacher in 2004-ish, moved to San Diego after meeting her ex-husband at summer solstice and started teaching in San Diego all the way up until 2020. Uh, She was a staff member at MPA, Midi Pity Academy in 2015 and was a part of the Aquarian Academy and reached the professional level um, all the way here until 2020. Um, She served at the SSS cabin, as an SSS cabin manager for multiple years at summer and winter solstices and co-directed uh, the Kalsa Youth Children's Camp, the KYC for the last three years. I think that's what that is, Kalsa Youth Camp. I think you're gonna have to make sure you tell me if that's correct. So I wanna welcome you, Jimena. Um, that was quite a long, uh, <laughs> amount of things that you've been involved in. So I want to thank you because I know you have a lot to share. And I want to ask you why you feel it's important to share your story. Yes, thank you so much. I I was very nervous and still am. Um, But I think um, this is going to be healing for me, going to bring closure and also hopefully help others um, to find peace. And um, I wanted to share um i think it's important to share also the voices of people that join in um i'm not a second generation but i found this path uh full of hope and and 
and full of naiveness and, and, and full of, of innocence. And, um, and I know like, like myself, there's many others that join in later. And uh, I also want to share that perspective of the people that join and that were not born into it. And also how lives get affected by marrying people that were born in, in, in 3HO and how that has ripple and repercussions in other people as well. Yeah. Yeah, you have a lot of elements here um, that you've that you've uh, mastered in terms of like your trainings, you know, even in the element of training, the marriage, the being not being born in. Um, I was quite astounded as 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 it, when you reached out to hear a, a little bit about you. So thank you again. Your courage um, matters, and it is courageous. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, why don't you um, bring us back so the listeners get to hear what I got. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it all started when I was a teenager. And uh, I guess that's very normal for teenagers to be seeking for more. And I remember I was pretty bored about my reality. Um, my first spiritual uh, teacher were books, you know, Carlos Castañeda and Uxley and Orwell. And I was kind of bored with my reality. And the easiest way to get something more was drugs and not like hardcore drugs, but like, you know, weed. And my parents were very, very scared about that. So when they found out that I was smoking a lot of weed, um, my mom was doing Kundalini yoga with this guy called Babaji that uh, was very close with Jiggy Bhajan and who sent him off to Mexico to create, you know, the 3HO movement and change the world. So Babaji was uh, my mom's teacher and, 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 and my mom shared she did not know what to do with me. And so he said, oh, don't worry, you know, just pay me this amount of money and, um, and I'll take care of your, of your daughter. And so my mom said, you know, you're just going to go there for four months max and, and let's see what happens. So it was that or rehab. And I said, Ooh, I'll just go there, the yoga, you know. And uh, four months became like four years. Um, I fully just drink the Kool-Aid. I loved, I loved the people that were in the ashram. It was finally the something else that I was looking forward, you know, like talking about spirituality and about auras and about all of these like the things that in my 15, 16 year old mind were like mind blowing. My sense of self was definitely not built. And I was very susceptible. And whatever Babaji said, I would believe it, you know. Um, where was it? Where did you where do you go to live with him for the four months? It was um it was an ashram in Mexico yeah. City called Guru Ramla's ashram. Okay. The Guru Ramla's ashram. And um and it was a beautiful house, like pool, sauna. Um, it was a fancy ashram and <laughs> nice one. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So keep going. <laughs> um, really enjoyed it. You're practicing every day. Practicing really every enjoying day. the lifestyle, you, you know, the diet. I mean, it's a lot of richness there in terms yeah. of lifestyle and that you haven't learned growing up in your life so far. And then they didn't say, oh, you have to change your name. Yet the whole environment, it's like you want to belong. And that's the next step. Yes. You know, changing your name is the next step. Putting sure. a turban on is the next step. Um, becoming a vegetarian is the next step. It's just a natural way. You don't question it. They don't tell you per se, but it's just like this, this culture that you're in. And, and then I really uh, got hooked with a name. They say that the spiritual name is, is your destiny. You know, that if you're called Johnny, you don't know what Johnny means. It's just Johnny. But when you have a spiritual name, it's like a reminder of your destiny. So Dion means, you know, a continuous meditation. And whenever you call my name, Dion, it's a reminder to make my life a meditation. So whatever I'm doing is a meditation towards God. So I thought that was the most romantic and beautiful thing. And, um, and I don't know who chose my name. You know, they say it's, it's Nuringen, but who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Um, we paid, we paid for my, for my name. Um, but it's, it feels now, you know, looking back very unpersonal, you know, my parents chose my beautiful name with lots of love and care and devotion. And so now it's a pride to be called Jimena, mm -hmm. but back then, uh, it was Dion. 
So like <clears throat> the feeling I'm getting is that you're, you're a teenager. Again, you have the choice between rehab and yoga and, you know, let's not fool ourselves. These lifestyle habits are wonderful. They're wonderful hab, you know, and even belonging in a, in a place where you're in community, that's a wonderful experience that's nurturing and feels supportive. And I know you're looking back at it now and you're kind of saying like the hook, but then it didn't feel like a hook. It more felt like belonging. Yes, it felt like belonging. It felt like I had found a purpose, a deeper meaning of life, that it was not just high school and shopping and drinking and clubs, because it's Mexico City, you can do whatever you want. Absolutely. You know, so I felt a, a lot of sense of, of depth. And then when my teacher saw that I was more serious, then he started taking more in and, and you know, giving me specific sadhanas and um and then he really took me as, as a project mm -hmm. um I remember I was very messy and and he kept warning me that hurricane sing would come and so I did not you know pay attention and one day I came and all my things were thrown um to the yard like mm -hmm. all of my things my underwear, my mattress, everything, all my possessions that I had were thrown on the yard and I had to um, bring them in and like put them in order. So I feel like it was in, in, in retrospect, one of the like real ashram experiences where they would wake up every day for do satna because nowadays they have um, ashrams, but I don't think like it was like, yeah. like the real ashram experience. We're just not living together and pay rent. No, this one was like, he would wake me up every morning to do sadhana. Mm -hmm. um, right. and, and, you know, not to, not to discount that because this is a really beautiful thing at that age, right? You're discovering, you're having probably life altering experiences within your own self and your own psyche and your own consciousness and your own relationship to yourself and your world. And I'm not, tr I'm not trying to discount the, where the result was, but for us to get a picture or a feeling. Oh yeah. It was beautiful. It yeah. was blowing. Like, changed my life and then i did not distinguish what was kundalini and what was sikhism sure but part of the satnas was you finish with a gurdwara so i don't know what i'm saying no one really explained to me but that was part of the our daily um, routine was doing the hukam so i was taught how to you know do the prayers the aravas and and um and that became my life you know, two hours of long at cars, 40 days as, as a community of the people in the ashram. And it was beautiful. They were like all these different ages. I was really young, but then there was like a 50 year old and like a 60 year old and it did not matter. I love that um, Babaji kept telling that we were rebels with a cause, you know, like I was always a rebel, but now I had a cause and, and I even dressed like with a, freaking turban on that I was such a rebel that I'm dressing really weird to tell the world I have a deeper meaning and I'm part of the Aquarian movement you know it felt a lot of pride and I took a lot of pride to be Dion and then Kalsa that's another step beyond but that's kind of like the picture of how beautiful my first encounter was where Seva was like the best thing that could have happened to me. I love cleaning toilets. Like literally that was my assignment. I love um, doing the yogi tea because we had yoga classes every night and then I would be, you know, the super young girl serving yogi tea to everyone. And mm. everyone look at me with like big eyes. And also that gave me that uh, appreciation that I desperately needed. Yeah. Yes, and that level of um, what felt like a level of connection, like you said, belonging, right? Yes, the belonging has a theme throughout my whole 3HO experience since the beginning until now. Got like it. that longing to belong with that, that, that necessity to be part of, of a group because I always felt like a misfit. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so then? So I, you know, I was all full in the super weird um, high school kid wearing the turban and living in an ashram yet driving every day to school um, and then um, I became I'm going to solstices so my first solstice was um, winter solstice and it was just it was just wow mind-blowing 
And then my second solstice was summer solstice. And that's when I met my future ex-husband. Um, you know, I was just brand new. I, um, I spoke English, but I had no idea. I had just seen a little teeny, teeny part. And then I go to solstice. Like, it's like the Mecca of, you know, turbans and beautiful lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just mind blowing. And I think there is this inner racism that um, Mexico or Latin American have that even though I know I'm not a racist and I know it, we're all the same, it's still ingrained in me that I think like a lighter skin and blue eyes means higher beauty or something. Mm. And I see that a lot in, in India too. Mm. But so I was blown away about the men. Oh my goodness, they were gorgeous. Like, <laughs> and then the turbans and the beards and I was just Regal, going Regal and the freaking Dumala and the, oh, I mean, Dada, my goodness gracious. Like he was even saying, Anyways, I remember all the girls would just stop. Time would stop when one of them would pass. <laughs> and maybe a kid, you know. And so um, I did not even know much of that the Midi Pity. I was brand new and I was pretty young. I was 19. Yeah. And I remember I was 19 because my ex-husband kept saying, ooh, I got with a teen. And okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was just minding my own business, walking down the hill, and he said, hey, <laughs> um, do you want to do tantric? And and I, I thought he was beautiful. And I said, yeah. And, um, and that was it. So tantric came, and then I was nervous because I did not know who he was. He, he was just one of many blue eyes, handsome, bearded, turban guy. So I was like, I have no idea who he is. Long he story short, his name. He didn't exchange names or anything. It was just you wanted to talk to you know, Guru Narayan Dadam, Guru Dadam. There, there's many. So at this point, when going to solstice, you hadn't like established relationships with people. This is like your first summer solstice. Brand new. I don't know oh. anyone. Okay. Anyone. Check. Anyone. Check. Anyone. Totally so makes sense. Okay. Guru Dadam gave me his name, but I did not remember his name. So long story short, we found each other. We did tantric for like three days, and um, and that's what the saying in the white tantric yoga like, don't do white tantric three days because you're gonna get married. And so that's what I heard, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get married. And so, um, long story short, we just you know started exchanging, we we dated, he came, he went, and um, and I really thought that by being with a Muti Pity student, a man, a kid, a Muti Pity, you know, uh, alumni, um, you're getting the real package. You know, these children are supposed to be sent to India to really study the teachings and to really be that change and to, they would never um, be unmoral, immoral, unmoral, I don't know how to say it they would never be um, out of character because they were born and raised with, <laughs> with the teachings of how to be a saint, but also um, a bread, bread winner, bread giver. Mm. Bread winner, like a provider, you mean? A provider or, a, you know, someone that can live in the world, but also oh, have a, a householder. Thank like you. <laughs> household. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like and that, you know, that's quite trained within the two, te you know, within the teachings, the householder yeah. and, and also like the, the projection of the young men, right? Just very strong. And I can see that, that image, right? And as a yoga student witnessing that. Yes. So I, I thought that my prayers were answered. I did not want someone like my own father that had um, alcohol abuse and that, you know, cheated on my mother. And I thought I was so safe with choosing, um, a man that was born in the dharma and that was sent to india for many years for him to be the best version of himself mm. someone that would wear a turban that was the rebel with the cause with me and we would teach together and have an ashram uh, and you know um offer satna and and to our community 
So I really thought I, I had that hope that um, my first husband was going to do that. That's, that's what I thought. And, um, and that's what the image that he gave also, he, um, you know, uh, so I was able to transfer as a exchange student from Mexico to San Diego. And then that's when he proposed mm. and, um, and then we lived together for, I mean, we always lived together and, and I generally think, um, he loved me. I generally feel like there was a connection. Um, it was not like I got, you know, horribly abused, but, but there was issues that, um, that were not shown since the beginning. I didn't know he had a, a really bad reputation, you know, reputation. Um, how? Well, now many years forward, I know that he was, uh, he was one of the bullies at MPA and he, he had, um, I see. Yeah. He abused people like bullying and yeah. like sexuality stuff, even Yogi Bhajan, um, this is a story he told me that Yogi Bhajan had to grab him by the balls, <laughs> my ex-husband. And he was like 14, 15, and he was like, stop fucking around because I think he was just being, you know, a teenager or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I didn't know all these things. He yeah. wanted to, to, for me to keep the image that he was, you know. This external saint where on the inside you're saying that he actually had a history of like fucking around and also had a, had a known character of being a, a bully through school yeah. that's now being revealed more and more and talked about publicly probably more yeah. for the first time ever yes um, okay so you, there's this whole underbelly but you're marrying kind of this projected image it's and projected you're full image. on bought in that if a child went to school for this amount of time in these teachings they must be so immersed and so in the shabad guru and all of the things uh, and yes. they possibly sleep around or drink or do crazy things that they wouldn't show the world, right? Like this is your, so in this marriage, suddenly you're like, oh boy, did it come out in parts? Like what started to happen? Um, so also just think going back, um, you know, I moved countries. I left all my whole family. So by marrying him, I also was marrying his family. Okay. And I felt like, wow, I finally have this family that is spiritual and like they encourage each other to meditate and this family you know I find I have a family yeah they will always have my back and 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 so that was like also I felt so good because they were they were well known in 3HO so I felt again this this longing to have to be part of something I did not feel like an outsider anymore because I was part of his family and his family was part of the 3HO, I don't know, inner circle. I mean, there's always an inner, 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 inner. But Okay, so then let's pause there for a second and give us a little perspective. Before getting married, you were feeling like an outsider as a yoga student, like as a yoga student that came from Mexico and you were so devoted. And even though you were doing sadhana and your and you're probably your daily practices and bonnies and all of the things, uh, Seva and Simran and all of the practices and very devoted and loved loved it all. Before getting married, you felt a, a distinct difference of, of feeling outside? When you come to Solstice and you don't know anyone, you do feel like an outsider. And um, especially when you see, so for, I was never taught to flowy to anything. So I come to United States to see the solstice and they have a specific way of dressing. They have a specific, the kirpan thing. We never learned that. And so you see that and you're thinking these people are the real deal. Like these people are dressing and behaving like, like a very exclusive part. And I want to be part of that. Mm. I don't even question why or if they're nice people or not, but I just felt like they were so radiant. Mm -hmm. And 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 especially I saw the cam camaraderie, like their bond was so strong that I wanted it to have that bond, if not with them, with someone, you know, but I was like, I want that. So I will sell myself and be dressing the part so that I can be part of that. 
Yes. And so, so then getting married, you felt a very distinct difference. It was like, wow, suddenly I actually belong to a family of the Dharma. They have a long history of the Dharma. Um, they're, they're like connected business wise, just like a whole realm in terms of what the family connection felt like. Yes. And all the kids went to MPA. So all their friends were part of that clique. And I felt like, perfect. I, I, I belong. I'm part of the cool kids, if that's even a thing. Um, but again, I was young and I, that's how I felt. Um, and I felt then I was safe. I was part of their family and I was safe. And um, it's just a really valid point to feel, feel into because I think it's, yeah, just pin that. <laughs> so we were married for like five years, I think, or together for five years. And then for the last two, I start sensing some things like smelling perfume on his beard or just things I did not check. Hiring, he was an owner of his business and he would hire like the skankiest, I mean, I don't want to judge, but there were just young beautiful skanky woman and um and that made me feel uncomfortable and I would talk about it I was like hey why do you smell like perfume like I can smell it all over like yeah. and then he will oh I just ate like caramel popcorn or <laughs> blah, blah 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 and then he would reverse it and be mad at me saying how dare you how dare you insinuate that I'm cheating on you? If I'm working so hard for you to go to school, I support you. I'm not, I think you have daddy issues. I'm not your father. Uh, because he knew that my father cheated on my mom. And ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's just flag gaslighting 101 here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, keep going. Um, and and um, that went on and, and until, you know, it all erupted and I found a picture and long story short, he has been cheating on me for like a year and having this type of double life. And I wanna say that I have nothing, I'm, if he wants to have sex with multiple women or be polyamorous or whatever, I'm not judging that. But I think his own issues, his own shaming at school about his sexuality, his own upraising, the whole MPA fucked upness messed him up that did not let him be authentic to himself and to me and to his family. And instead of saying, hey, I like these things, like, okay. But then he dragged me in. And instead of having the courage to be like, I like this, he had he felt the need of of putting that part of himself somewhere else like literally a double life he had a, a second name you know he was grew down with me in the day and he was felix at night you know and oh. and um and i think again is this pressure that they have, these kids that were sent in MPA about his own sexuality, about shaming or about, you know, if he wants to drink, like there's this heavy guilt about drinking. There's nothing wrong about drinking. And I think he had to hide that as well. Um, so yeah, that was, it was, it was messy. I want to just point out that like what I heard you say is, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying I'm polyamorous, I, I wanna have multiple partners or whatever we wanna do. There's nothing right. wrong with it if we can own up and be truthful about that. Regardless of what the issues might be, right? And, and there might be several things that he's gone through in his life and that you've gone through and that I've gone through. But regardless of whatever we've gone through, the least we can bring to the table is truth, right? Is honesty, it's saying, this is what I want. I want many women instead of one, or I want many partners instead of one. And when we have a history of abuse or mm -hmm. trauma, and that trauma goes unacknowledged, and the longer it goes unacknowledged, then we're harboring shame and we're harboring lots of other things that then create acting out behaviors 
and can even lead to predatory behaviors, right? And so having history of trauma can really create this because it goes undealt with. And I think you're pointing out something that is so important in our Dharma because it's not unique to your ex-husband. You know, it's a formula that I know personally my dad struggled with. And lots and lots of people in our Dharma had lots of sleeping around and it was never talked about and it was never discussed. And now, I, right now, sorry, go ahead. I want you to jump in there. Well, it's just also reminding how I just feel bad for him because I feel he was so conflicted. I have a lot of compassion because he was so conflicted because I know it had not been easy for him. He wanted to please his family. He wanted to please me. He wanted to please his own sex drive or whatever it was. So he had, I'm still haven't figured it out and I don't care at this point. I'm putting it to rest, but these memories are resurfacing, resurfacing how he kept saying to me, you're showing too much cleavage, you know, he would show it to me, or I don't want you to be drinking coffee because that's addictive thing. I don't want you to be in social media. Like he was super controlling with me. Wow. And then like flip the coin or whatever. He, he was not telling his secretary that he was, she was showing too much cleavage, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like full on black and white. Life. Double life. It's a double life. And, and I hope, um, I hope that he's living with more peace and um, and I hope that he, he has fine truth and that he stops the need of um, trying to satisfy his family or whoever he needs to sure. pre pretend or I don't know. Yeah, and it, you know, that's his experience. Um, but I think that it is so... Um you know, what we've seen obviously in the last five to six months of the double life of, of the teachings itself, of the, you know, the teacher who brought these teachings, you know, and how can we, those that grew up in this, not have un stuff that it relates to double life energy in us because yes. we marinated in it. And I know it was very hard for his family too. His family has been amazing with me. Like since the beginning, they were very kind. And after they found out they were mortified, they had no idea. And I know they feel like shit, like they care for me and they were- Good people. Good people. They were flag up, flag up raster. I don't know how to say it. They were shocked, um, but they're, it's their son and they're always going to support his son. Um, awesome where the loyalty is, right? Where the loyalty is. Don't do it, right? Yes. So that was then, you know, the second part of my story saying, fuck, like I just lost my marriage because, you know, I no one gets married to get divorced. I, he was my life. He was my family. He was everything. He, I put all my money in that basket. So when that did not work out, I mean, the, the disillusionment, the my whole illusion broke down about my marriage, but also about 3HO a little bit. It it, it fell down the pedestal, the whole midi pity thing. Because being with him, I started noticing his friends. I started noticing them. They don't do satna. The ones that do satna was me and all these other people that join in later. Like we're the <laughs> ones um, who are like really excited about starting a 40 day meditation. My ex-husband didn't give a shit about it. Like, as long as, and he would say, like, you meditate for me. You're, you, you're the one that, you know, can hold me in. So he wanted me to meditate, and he was very proud and happy that I did. Um, but he not, he didn't, he didn't do it. And then that's time when I realized, okay, so these MPA kids are just bluff, and they have this culture about being cool and rap music and cussing and. And so that was my my divorce brought a lot of um, breaking down of illusions, um, not only with my marriage but also with the whole community. Mm. Mm. And then once again, I was an outsider. I have lost my family, and of course, they're gonna choose his son. So I was just alone in a foreigner country, and now I had a big 
D of divorcee in my forehead. And yeah, I was young, um, but I felt like no one would be with me again. And um, I mean, some, some people knew that he cheated on me, but I did not go into itty, itty, gritty details about it. Like you didn't go um, blasting it in the community per se. Obviously you spoke with the family, but like it wasn't like a publicly known thing. No, I did not put it in Facebook. Hey, my husband cheated on me. But, you know, I was pretty heartbroken and people would ask what's wrong. And it's like, oh, he cheated and, you know, we separated. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I think infidelity, it's not the end of a marriage. I think infidelity can actually be overcome and can bring you closer. And if you overcome infidel infidelity, you can overcome anything. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hey, let's, let's, sorry, let's fix this. Like, I want to fix it. It's okay if you cheated on me. Like, let's work into this together. And so I remember his parents sent us to Sakar with LA. The, and so that was another shit show. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> he did not go to any of the sessions. And, and again, he was not able to come to the truth. Mm. So much pushing his parents, like what's wrong? Uh, uh, all the, I was like, it's okay, you're forgiven. Let's, let's, let's fix it. No, no, no. Until he just told me, Dion, I'm going to do this with you over and over and over again. So I'm very happy that he finally had the balls to be honest with me mm. because I would have gotten back. So, um, I mean, I want to pause there and just say that what we now, what we know now about what we've heard from, from kids of nitty pity, on the Zoom calls and stuff like that, like the extent of the trauma that a lot of them received, but also then inflicted, and the cycle of how long that trauma cycle has gone on without it being spoken to. Um, I think that what you're pointing out is that, you know, it's that in real life. Yes. Hurt people, hurt people. And then and, walk off, right? And then the cycle continues in our relationships and our children. And and I remember, I mean, he did not cheat on me with one. It was with multiple. And I think he started living with this idea. I think now he stopped, I don't know. But when we were going through it and I wanted to find more about what happened, he he kept saying that he could help a woman that by being intimate with them, <laughs> that's so stupid. By being intimate with them, he could help them. So one had bulimia and the other one had, you know, alcohol issues. So he kept saying that he could help them. So I just made fun of him saying, okay, so you're changing the world one vagina at a time. And <laughs> I was like, but truly at some point that's, that's basically what he, um, he had said that he he felt that he could change women he can help them by being intimate with them <clears throat> um so that's when i knew it was not more it was more than one um wow yeah so her people her people again i hope he has found peace and and truth and that his family also has found peace and truth yeah, so let's bring us back to, so you're now back to family list, but you're still in the Dharma. Yeah, this doesn't make you leave. No, it actually makes me go deeper. I was so like, oh my God. about that. You're I'm, feeling the, your, your loss, but go ahead. Yes, I'm heartbroken and I decided to take Amrit because, you know, I want to give my head to the guru because I'm so lost. And so what do you do? You just dive deeper because you want to be held in the community. I I wanted it to be seen, yet I was so insecure to show myself. I was now insecure about being with men because I was divorced and my personality is pretty outgoing. And so I've all of a sudden, you know, I need to be careful and not coming too flirty because that's that's also a, um people have told me like oh you're flirty i'm like no i'm not flirty i'm just mexican i'm just me <laughs> um so i um took amrit and 
and start working at solstices. I um I, I, I became part of karma yogis everywhere. And then I became the manager of many things. And then by working, I started making more connections. And again, I had my solstice family and um, I started making a name for myself with, without being Guru Dhanam's wife. I was just Dion, Dion from Mexico. And, but yet I was still outside. I was not the MPA kid and I wanted it to. Mm. People saw me so young and they saw me with a pretty turban. <laughs> Because you can really judge someone by the turban, you know? Yes. <laughs> Say that again. You can really judge people by their turbans. If they have like a, you know, misshaped turban, you're like, oh, you're just starting. Or you have the MPA turban. Or you can really categorize um, with the turban shape. So people would see my turban. They would see me. And they would assume immediately that I was born into 3HO. And I felt so much pride in that. And they would ask me, who are your parents? And I was like, oh, no, I'm, you know, I just joined in. But then they asked that so much that I start to maybe even believing that, okay, well, fuck it. I'm just going to lie <laughs> because of my deep desire to be part of it. And now I feel so embarrassed that I did because my family, my Mexican family is beautiful. Mm. But in that beginning, I was like, I just want to be you guys. So I had to lie. I was like, oh, you don't know them. They they left the Dharma, but you know, we're from Mexico. And I lied. I would lie. And um, wow. I, I went to MPA for one year, you know, um, and there's no need to lie. But anyways, I was young and stupid. And no, but I don't want to pause that. I don't think it was being young and stupid. So let's just flag that and say okay. that culture you're pointing out a culture and that culture created such a an inside outside experience mm -hmm. no matter how dedicated no matter what how devoted you didn't feel that you could get on the inside and then you got busier and busier is what i heard you you became more and more in charge of things so you made more connections and this is somewhat the formula right get busier and busier make your way through right and so it's you're you're spelling out a formula that you experienced very recently that this is a culture that was very old that has been brewing and being created for a long time. Thank you. Thank you for pausing. <laughs> I can just, yes, I, um, I remember saying to G1, um, when she asked me, what grade were you in? And I said, 11th grade, I think I'm just making it up. Oh, then you must know my, my brother. And I'm like, oh shit. No, <laughs> and and then I felt guilty. Yet I wanted to continue people to believe that I was one of them. And then, as you said, I got busier and busier, trying to climb the ranks within three HO. Tell us what that means. Like what that really experience was like. Who? Like what did you do? What What does it mean? Because. I've been out of 3HO so long, and even when I got retouched back in, I was doing it on my own terms because right. of I wasn't interested in kind of like the social order and the what I knew to be hip hypocrisy and incongruency. And so for a long time ago, I mean, I connected with the people I loved and, and had relationships with still, but I'd left all that behind. So I want to hear that in present day is my okay. point. Well, in present day, in my experience was that... Um, I start um, applying to become Solstice manager uh, first of, of, I think it was children's camp within Solstice. That was great. And then the um, Suri Singh Sub Cabin. The Suri Singh Sub Cabin was where Yogi Bhajan would like be during Solstices, where he can relax, where he could have his guests come and go, where all the secretary were, where all the- Remind us what year this is. This is obviously he was still living. So oh, the Sri Singh Sub Cabin is all, it's always been there when he was living or even today. Well, we don't have solstices now, but like last year, you know, there was a Sri Singh Sub Cabin. And as a manager, 
you have to be the host, the hostess of that space. You need to be in contact with the secretaries where it's at Simran um, and have everything ready for them. They're very special diets and they're guests and you need to clean everything and cook for them and have everything looking beautifully because that's what Yogi Bhajan was. And you want to keep the vibration and, you know, hear stories. And so I start first working there as a Sevadar and then I became the manager of it. And I felt like that was just ha- climbing the ranks of 3HO. I don't know how to explicitly say, because it's not like there's a pyramid, yet there is. You know, the, the CEO is Prit Paul. And I always wanted to look good for her, of course. Then we have Anan saying that he was amazing. He very humble, very hardworking. And he was never a yogi. But what I saw is, again, the double life the hypocrisy of many people that I was hoster you know hosting that the secretaries would come and they would have like super dark you know espresso or they would have like tattoos or they would be in their Instagram the whole time they were not meditating (laughs) at all and that has been a theme that I've seen starting with my husband ex-husband the double life I've seen that in the secretaries. I've seen that in the yoga teachers. And then I did it myself. Being a trainer at professional level, I was not doing the work yet. I tell them what to do. So I was becoming part of that cycle at the end. I know every Yogi Bhajan quote. I know all the questions in the Aquarian exam. And we are training them to memorize as well. Yeah, we're going to get to teacher training. So let's let's pause on there. Let's go back to the cabin. So essentially what you're saying is you were when you're manager of the SSS cabin, you're taking care of the secretaries that are coming there for say leading white tantric or coming there for whatever. Like so you're holding the vibration of the space so when the tantric facilitators come, you have to serve. So that's correct? Yes. That's correct. Or 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 the guests that are going to come to speak and the Peace Paraday, um, that's the one that we host. Pretty smallly, the, the secretaries are going to be facilitating white tantric yoga. Okay. And scheduling their massages. And, you know, the instructions that I got is they are the representatives of Yogi Bhajan. Their vibration is Yogi Bhajan's. And so it's you need to clean like if Yogi Bhajan is going to be here. You need to talk like if Yogi Bhajan is going to be here. You need to dress like Yogi Bhajan is here. Um, And I really believed it. Like, I really, really believed it. And I think my health has gone terribly wrong because of all these years, not doing only the serious things at Cabin, but Calsa Youth Camp, but every solstice. Like, I I paid in order to get my ass worked off. It's not like they pay you. No, no, no. You you pay like a hundred and something dollars to be a manager and to get super stressed and yelled at. And then I think my health is recovering from all those days and nights of stress. Now you're doing that and you're also doing yoga and your sadhanas and all the things? Well, not during solstice because I couldn't. Like I literally went to bed and then I had to be there at five. Um, But I'm doing that with a full-time job I'm doing that with every tra- every weekend train uh, weekend we have teachers training here in San Diego. I'm doing that um, trying to have a social life. It was it was a lot. Yes. Yeah. And the whole ethos is keep up. The whole thing is you're not you're not strong enough, you know, and you're not going to be part of the managers or you're not going to get to talk to Shalala secretary if you don't keep up. Um and I wanted it, I think it's come from a self-worth place that I needed it to be seen and I needed it to be appreciated. And a way to have that is through stupidly amount of work. What was the hierarchy that was kind of thrown out as like the special? You get to talk to so-and-so if you reach this level. Like what, what well, was that? For secretaries, like Satsimran was a big deal. We have Nurinjan, the one that gives the names. Um, she would come a lot and she was very sweet. They're all so sweet. And I always thought that Tatsuman was totally in love with Jogi Bhajan. This is me before me knowing anything. And I just thought it was so cute that she was infatuated with a dead man. 
and that you know she was still loyal to the day because she talks she used to talk to him she used to talk about him like how i talk about my current husband mm. you know when you're just totally in love and you see that that's how i what i got from from satsimran mm. But the hierarchy was like, oh, my Hankitan is going to come. <gasps> oh, I heard that, you know, she can like, whatever. And so all my staff, I was a little bit more cynical at that space. But all the people that I hired and that I was continuing the narrative, repeating like a parrot, all these things that I've heard, they were super nervous. And they were like, really catching themselves. Like, I cannot have any bad thought because I'm cooking this sweet potato for Satsimran, you know? <laughs> right, playing into the whole mythology and really getting excited about the specialness, right? And the kind of the ethos that's created around like this special ring and, yes. and work. And now you're basically saying you're perpetuating that same narrative to the ones below you. Yes. So they are striving for these special moments with these special people that are coming in who are directly, uh, taught you know taught by yogi bhajan or whatever they're the secretaries you know like they have this whole mysticism around them and they were the ones who directly served yogi bhajan mm. they're the ones that got all the downloads from him they're mm. the ones that have the auric capacity to sustain and hold a white tantric yoga that's what we learned yeah and yeah you're a teacher trainer by this time or you're just a you're just a teacher or what, what's going on in terms of your yoga life so i was always a teacher i moved to san diego and i was started teaching right away there was no training then and then uh me and mirvani we offered the first teacher's training in san diego with guramrit and that's when my academy began um and that's something else that i've seen and that's why I wanted to be part of the ranks of 3HO that I did not have any connections. I did not have any aunties or uncle G's that can like help me move forward. Everything that I've earned was by myself. And I got so mad <laughs> when I see all uh, the same person, people starting at the same level at me, but then Hari Charan is their auntie. And then immediately they were professional. It took me like nine years um, of hard work to do that. So pause, because as listeners and myself, we don't even understand what the academy is and what the ranks of it are. So if you could kind of frame it for us, so we get some real, uh, that sounds like that's gravity. That sounds like some people got promoted right through because there was connections through the auntie, uh, uncle yeah. chain, but we don't even know what the levels are. So start there. So the uh, Aquarian Academy is something that Kara I did or 3HO, I'm not even sure who is who anymore, so that you are a, a loud trainer to teach future Kundalini yoga teachers. And there's many ranks. First, you have to have many hours of teachings. And by the way, they keep raising the standards. So five years ago, this was very different. But now I think you have to have certain hours of teaching, of teaching Kundalini yoga regular. Then you have to have like two times done level one training as a Sevadar. And then you need to do all the second levels, the level twos, life cycles, conscious relationship, conscious communication, lifestyles. There's five. And each one- Pause, for pause. the first level, you're saying first you have to have the amount of teaching hours, then you have to do um, level one as a Sevadar for two level ones. Correct. So we know that a level one basically usually goes for a year. Sometimes they're kind of clumped together over several weekends, but usually it's like a 10 month kind of span out. So you have to do two of those working for free. Yeah. Then you have to do level twos, which are five different courses. How many, what do you have to do with that? That's like two grand each. Oh, then you have to do pay, do like actually take those courses. Yeah. Okay. And then you can apply to be an intern. <laughs> I see an intern in the academy yes yes what does it mean to be an intern an intern is basically another sevadar but you get more bench hours um you can teach an actual not yoga but part of the curriculum which now i i feel like throwing up humanology is 
such a bullshitting joke. Mm. And um, so, so part of the bench hours, you get to teach something that it's not just yoga. It could be humanology or it could be the chakras or it could be something else. So it's an intern. It's sorry, I'm blanking out. It's another level. Then it's professional. Then it's a trainer. So I think like overall there's four and there's more requisites. Like you need to have the level three, the, the, the Mela thing because they keep raising it up. Why? I don't know, mm. but they're, that's not a good way to become a trainer um, because. Well, it's not set in stone, number one. So you don't know what, you, what it's really accrediting. Um, but I want to just point out like what you're talking about. So it took you nine years to get to that third level, which is professional. And I just did that in like March. You just and finished it. I just finished it. And they interview you. And um, and I, I was never sure I wanted to do that. It's not for money, you know? Like I'm blessed enough to have a good job. Um, my husband has a good job. So I've never really depended on Kundalini yoga, but. But know, all of those trainings are like level one is like three grand, maybe 3,500, right? Yes. And then yeah. level twos are how much? Two grand. So the trainers make a lot of money and they're just repeating. They're just repeating like parrots. They're just pushing play on the master touch video they're doing traticum pictures as like cult 101 they literally you have put up a, a candle and you look into yogi bhajan's eyes for like half an hour or something and that's that was part of the curriculum i don't probably they have changed it now um well, now that it's happened in the last few months but i don't even know if that's the case because if my understanding is correct with the way that the teacher training disseminates, it really depends on who those level, that those that core teacher is, because it can be a very different experience depending on who the assembly of teachers are. Correct. And because my fear- is Kind of up to them, right? Like this base curriculum they have to follow, but how they deliver it is kind of up to the teacher. Isn't that right? Okay. Yes, it's up to the teachers, but the requirements are the same. Like white tantric yoga was a requirement. Yes, it's a part of the teacher training. That now, because of COVID, uh, instead of white tantric yoga, they have to do a 62 minute meditation. Um, four Aquarian sadhanas is a requirement. So th there are certain things that are sure a requirement, but other things depend on the teachers um, that are led. But honestly, a lot of, of, of the trainers, it's all about money. Like that's their bread and butter. That's how they earn money is through, through tra trainings. Um, and it's just stop feeling juicy. It's, it's just become so rigid and so, so dry that save your money and find other training that it's more experiential and less repeat after me. Explain that more. What was your experience as a teacher and then going through the academy? Obviously, you had to train with different teachers or were you just with one and this parroting concept, like help us understand the experience because you wouldn't have spent so much time if there wasn't something you were getting. But then at some point, was it just the break open of all this in the community that made you see? No, I, I had been feeling that there was something missing, but I got so comfortable in in my persona as Dion. Mm. I felt so comfortable with teaching once a week, twice a week, and to get that beautiful aha moment when new brand students that have never done Kundalini feel horrible and then they do a class and they are releasing, they are crying, they are shiny, they are radiant, and you get hooked on that. Oof. But then you start believing that it's you and your spiritual ego grows. So it's like, oh, I must be a very good teacher. <laughs> but um, so I got very comfortable in there. I got very comfortable in the spiritual bypassing in, in just sounding very wise because I can tell you a lot of Yogi Bhajan quotes that I could just, you know, sprinkle them here or there and make me sound somewhat intelligent and profound. So I got comfortable with that, but I felt dry. As I was telling you before, I used to journal a lot 
and be very creative and collaging. You know, this is when me was a kid, a teenager before Kundalini. And the minute I started doing Kundalini yoga, I did not feel the need to journal anymore. I thought, okay, I'm just like diversing my energy. Until some like last year or something, I tried to journal because everyone keeps talking about journaling. <laughs> so I was like, I'm gonna give it a try. <laughs> And Granny Sean, nothing came out, not a single drop. I did not know what to write. I only had Yogi Bhajan quotes and Yogi Bhajan poems and memorized seven steps to happiness or whatever. Um, and then that's when I realized I have an issue. I have lost my voice. I There's nothing on me. There's no juiciness. There's no flow. I become rigid and dry. And judgmental and um yet i was very comfortable being dion i had all my whole life set and i had a lot of students you know cheering me on saying how amazing how great teacher i was seeing how profound they they healed and that meditation what's the name of that meditation oh my goodness thank you so much dion or whatever but and I was wearing a turban, you're wearing Bana, you have the full yeah. projection happening. Yes. So that's also made me feel like the only thing I have, it's my turban or, you know, but I don't do satna anymore. I, I, I try to do a 40 day, but I keep breaking it. Um, my health is going to shit. I, I start trying to have a baby with my husband and it's not happening um oh, pause so you had met somebody that wasn't in the dharma as a second oh, connection yeah. i know bring us to that point because i want to i want to frame that you were still wearing your turban and really practicing when you I met was, him yes so i was i was you know teaching training students kundalini yoga everything and on my way to winter solstice actually i met him and i was wearing my turban and oh my gosh, I saw him and he was so handsome. He was so beautiful. Just an average Joe with a backpack on and a skateboard on his backpack. And he looked like a Viking to me, just super hot, um, redhead, tall. And long story short, we end up sitting next to each other. And um, he had never heard of yoga. He had never heard of yoga, <laughs> not even Kundalini, just yoga in itself. Um, he, he's from a small town in Jacksonville, Florida. And so I said, I'm going to be in Florida. Come on over to check out what yoga is. And so, um, he came to solstice and I don't know how he did not run because he was full on, you know, cold mode. Um, you're in the kitchen, we were in the kitchen and then all of a sudden everyone stops because I don't know if you remember in solstices, um, all the karma yogis have a meditation. So exactly 9.30, everyone stops and there's, there's big speakers. Why, 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 Guru, why, or whatever it is. But that's that's what happened. So Scott, that's the name of my husband, was like, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, interesting, this girl, she's full of surprises. So, um, and I was, again, a little bit scared of what would people would say that I was with a man that was not a Sikh. Um, I was already feeling hurt by the community, people targeting that I was flirty. Oh, and then- yeah, I, want you to, I want you to go back and tell that because that's a really good, that's pretty poignant. Like when you're not married, now you're kind of quote date, like what did it mean to date? after your divorce and you're kind of like, you have that shot. I got divorced and then you can only date certain amount of people in the Dharma mm -hmm. because there's not that many. There's not that many young available um, people. So if you date two or three, woof, you know, you have been around the block and you get a reputation. And by dating, I mean like holding hands and reading Japji together at Gurdwara, people know that you're, you know, checking each other out. So I remember um, I was young. I uh, had been like two years, three years divorced. And this beautiful young man came into the community. Very charming, huge smile, huge smile. And, and I liked him. And we started dating. 
which means like, holding hands and reading <laughs> and maybe going for a walk. Going for like, a walk and eating longer together. What year is this you're saying? Like 2014. So in 2014, within this kind of like yoga, 3HO, Kundalini space, this is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is if you are dating, kind of like showing interest, um, it's like holding hands or reading by, to the guru with each other or reading Japji or like something that's kind of like devotional based, but not yes. like actually like taking off your clothes and rubbing on each other or something. <laughs> Just clarifying. Yes, like very <laughs> pure. I mean, yeah. Okay, I was just clarifying because it's 2014. You 2014. Know, it's, not, it's not 1984. Because no. I remember that narrative in 1984. And I remember that atmosphere in 1984. And I'm eight and then I'm growing, right? So I'm just placing it. So yeah, you- no, thing has not changed. People will talk. If you are if you are reading Japji together, they know that you have interest in each other and they'll start like pointing fingers and judging. So that's what happened with this young man and I. He was a little bit younger than me, like two years. And and he shows a lot of potential, you know. And I remember this young guy, two old two years older than me, he was not even a senior Uncle G. No, no, no. He was like another MPA graduate actually came to me and said, Dion, I need to talk to you. I really don't think you should be dating her dev because um, he's too pure for you. You've been divorced and I heard that you're divorced. You had something to do with it and um, you should not be dating him. Um, he's just too, too innocent and too pure for you. And Someone- I just remember I felt like you know, the knot in your throat that you're about to cry. And I, and he made me feel so dirty and like evil. And, um, and I just shut down. I didn't confront him. I didn't say anything. I just shut down and said, yes, thank you. Wow. (laughs) I didn't say anything. I was so heartbroken. And then the ironic thing is that this young man get going on and he dated multiple young beautiful woman all over different flavors colors i bet no one took him on the side and said hey i don't think you should date so and so so that really made me feel like wow like there's something wrong with our culture and the men have a priority over the woman and they're telling us they're they're running it implicitly because that's also what happened in MPA. As a, as a staff in MPA, the boys club culture is dominant in 2015 or in 1986. It doesn't matter. It's still run by men. Um, even though the narrative is that the women are the eagles or whatever. No, that's that's just like the, the verb that we're we set two women so that we keep in them because we the appreciation of the woman and the grace of God movement and it's all about the woman. No, no, no. The men are the ones that are telling us what to do or that's how I felt at least. Mm. Mm. So in MPA, I went as a staff for one year, 2015. Um, there's no training. And, and, and again, I wanted to be part of the MPA culture. So I was like, perfect, this is a staff. They pay you nothing or at least for me. Um, I have a, I had a degree. I went to UCSD and that doesn't mean shit. They pay me, they paid me $500 a month with one day off a week, which was not really a day off. I still end up working. Um, and um, I think other people that were my age with no degree, they got paid double or triple because they were men and they went there as a student. Um, and in my year, um, I, I didn't have a horrible experience, to be honest. Like, I really had a great time sometimes. But I do feel that there was a permanent boys club culture and feeling. I was intimidated by the principal. I didn't feel comfortable um, saying, hey, Jagged, what's up? Like, he was just so intimidating. He's big and... 
and just cool also and oh i mean i felt like i had to play basketball to like be part of them i don't know it was it was it was definitely out of place again yet they are expecting you to call information and to teach pe and to teach classes as if you had been there forever but you can't i i, I couldn't so it was a permanent stress like i was living in stress every morning trying to call information pretending that i knew what i was doing yet i had zero training and i was expected to do so and the kids could smell it on you and they would bully you because you were new yeah. because they have seen it on the other staff um there was um yeah in my year there was um uh, also a sexual uh abuse thing in one of the students um and i've heard that there's one more after the year that i left and i think that's it that was so 15 and you're saying 16. there was one in 2016 and then i think that was it so in thousand heard so far right that we heard so far 2015 um i was with a girl that was going with me every day because she was dating a boy at 14 years old which is pretty normal mm -hmm. and because she was dating she got uh, punished with a 40-day kriya called the instinctual self-kriya so she had to do that every day so because she's dating somebody else at midi pity she yeah. got a punishment of doing a 40-day kriya yes and she would do it with me every day for me to super supervise that she was doing it i see and in their dating was dating actual was it still holding hands and reading from the good or was it different was dating well, i think they were you know it, kissing here or there or whatever they were doing and um but honestly i mean i was kissing boys at 14 as well and i don't think there's anything wrong with that my my opinion um yeah but I agree um it's a boarding school so they they punish her with 40 day kriya and i had to supervise her and i had to do it with her so we, we became very close and you know if the guy got punished too? Huh, interesting. Just curious. I have no idea. My my world were those girls and I was disconnected totally with the boys and I'm so happy because I think the boys have it way rougher than the girls. Okay. Um Yeah, so this girl comes to me and says, "Hey Dion, my friend so and so tells me that they pin him down and they put something on his butt." I don't remember if it was a dildo or a broom or something, but it was, it was something on his butt. And he's again, like 14, 13. And, and I said, this is, this is absolutely not right. And the boy was there with me telling me, like, he was like, oh. The boy who had been sexually abused was right there saying this with you. Yes. He was like, I don't want to tell my Mukia Jetadar, like he's, he's, I was a Mukia Jetadar of the girls. So that's so, basically the team leader. Like you were yeah. a team leader in like the equivalent of you and the boys. Yeah. Okay. He, he did not want to tell him oh. or anyone, but he felt, so he told the girl and the girl said, oh, Dion will like, she's the right person. I was not the right person. I was so freaked out. I, I, um, you know, I wish I had done something different, but again, I was intimidated by the principal and I did not want to tell him. So I decided to tell my equivalent, his Mukia Jetadar, and I say, hey, DJ, like, this is what I heard. Do something about it. Oh, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it. One week passed, he had not done shit about it. So that's when I knew, I knew, I, I need to tell it to um, the principal. I don't remember if it was Amrit or Jagat, but I told either one. And then, you know, he got exp someone got expelled and he was taken home and everything got taken care of but that's 2015 and that still happens wow. i heard you know donham's podcast i was like how many years ago is still happening um drugs i mean that will happen anywhere um but so i just wanted to share that and and how the so boy a week later the your equivalent he didn't do anything and that's why you had to go to a person higher correct to stop it correct and um other than how it was handled do you know if if 
like the that Jetadar, like has that been talked about? Has any of the that been talked about since the Mitty Pity kids have been talking, or is that still not? He talked? got fired, okay. um, but also because he was messing around with another staff member, and that's the thing. They're so young, like they're not, or even me. I was so young, like maybe we were not prepared to be the mamas and the papas of these little children. Mm. Um, and he was also a student at MPA. And his priority were, was another girl. <laughs> it was not this kid. So I think MPA is learning that they need to hire other people if they ever open again. I don't know if that's ever gonna happen. But so I think that was dealt with. I think they talked to him, but they, they, they fired him and they never invited him. They never, he never went back basically. And then you're saying the child who this was happening to, he got sent home and, and, and somebody came over, right? Somebody came over to address it? Yeah, so Banashi Singh came from LA to address it. And I don't know why him. I don't know what's his training. I know he was a student there. And was that your thing? What? Who was that you said? Avanashi Singh, the okay. really tall redhead from LA. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Now I'm like questioning, like, why him? Like, why was his training? I know he was relating something with the military, but I don't know why he specifies in trauma. Probably not. I don't know. But they sent him over and he asked me questions and he was trying to do an investigation. Um, there wasn't like police intervention or there wasn't any investigation back home that you know of or anything? That I know of. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what happened. And I never went back. Um, I was still engaged. I was dating my, my now husband. Um, so going to that story, because that's how I find closure in all of this is through love that I found it's okay to be yourself. And that I finally, well, hold on, pause. I wanted to say you're in Mitty Pity. It's 2015. You had told us the story around uh, meeting your husband on the way to solstice. So what year was that? Like 2000. 13, 14, okay, sorry, so, so, years I'm blurring out. And that's okay, I'm just trying to get a little context. So basically, you know, you're in teacher training, you're teaching, you're starting to do the Aquarian Academy, like you're really into your practice, your lifestyle here, but you've met a man who's not in the Dharma, he's totally pouring love on you and you're learning, you're starting to notice that you're not juiced and you're starting to like, that's starting to happen during those years or did that happen after Mitty Pity? what's juiced like when you said that you're not juiced up like when you said oh, um, juiced up yeah you know, like you're writing your journal and you noticed like you felt dry nothing like, come out like, i yeah. have lost my voice was that after midi pity or was that happening along the way that was after midi pity okay that scott was before midi pity i was with scott when I was in Midi Pity long distance. Exactly. So you're with him at least three or four years before. Then you decide to go to Midi Pity for this year during your relationship. Then you come back and you're still in the Aquarian Academy, just teacher training, working to be the trainer of teachers, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm just getting, putting it in perspective. Yeah. So, so then? So this man, oh my goodness. Um, it was really hard for me to, to be with him. Because I really was attached to the idea that I wanted to be with someone on the Dharma. I was so attached that I needed to have another 3 h old person in my life. I wanted the turban. I wanted the beard. Oh, well, he has a beard, my husband. I wanted, you know, travel the world teaching together. Mm. I wanted to offer sadhana in my house. I wanted it that with desperation. Mm. So it took me a long time to let Scott in and to put my guard down and he show me little by little bit how beautiful the simplicity is how powerful it is to be an average joe and how healthy mm. how fucking healthy he is there's no there's no double life at all there's no compartmentalization there's no hurt there's no pain he's just Scott, simple, humble, steady. But it took me a long time and we almost did not make it just because I was so attached to the idea of me being with, you know, 
a thing in a Khalsa. I did not want to take his last name because I still wanted to be a Khalsa. Um, I made him go to teacher's training. I made him do my tantric yoga. And he said, like, that's the most painful thing. Like, I'm, I'm in so much pain on my hips and on my knees. Like, this is so painful. And then when I saw his pain, I was like, I'm never going to let you do this again. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to make you do this. I'm so sorry. But so little by little, he just starts showing with his love that, like, it's just so beautiful to to not to just be yourself yeah. you know and my and then I realized also that I needed to spend time with him because he's my family and solstice people are not my family Mervani and Guru Mantra are not my family if I get sick no one's gonna care no one's gonna come here rub my feet and make me soup mm. Imran is not gonna come here and make my soup you know um it doesn't matter. I'm gonna get. I'm. I'm replaceable like that. Three H O. Don't give a shit about you. Mm. They don't care about you. Like you, there's many sevadars that are gonna come and take your place in a heartbeat. So I stop realizing that I need to stop giving my life and my health to these people that really, genuinely don't care about you, and start putting my love in the people that do. And these people are Scott and my family from Mexico. Mm. And that has been everything. I literally, I was giving so much to all these people and and just the realization that you're not important. You, you we, we're raised to believe that we're so important and the titles and, and the work that we're doing, we're not important. And, and when you mean raised, you mean like when you're raised in 3HO, like going through yeah. this, like be becoming the becoming of from the yoga student into the lifestyle, into the way, into the path, that whole. Yes. And also in, in solstices, the managing, like, mm. oh, Dion, you're so amazing. We cannot do this without you. So I used to really stop believing. And because your my self-esteem was not strong, I really, that was my feeding when in reality, anyone can do that job they're just kind of sweet talking to you so that you keep slaving yourself for free <laughs> and um so my 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 whole lesson has been who am i who is my family who is important and what's important and, and, and my health yeah i do think again my hormonal hormonal balance has been off whack because of lack of sleep yeah. because these stupid diets because the stress because of me bending myself backwards to please people that don't care about me mm. um that threw my hormones out of whack um cold showers is the worst thing that i could have done for me um Cold showers, the satna, bad sleep, um, the vegetarian diet, it's not good for me either. Um, now that I'm not vegetarian, I, I can really see a shift. Mm. Um, so my whole lesson is there's so much beauty and being nobody. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. And there's so much freedom in being nobody. And um, yeah and love Give a and, and that you're somebody because yeah. you're reclaiming your name as you spoke to yes but you don't understand that the nobody means not, like not doing the rank so on one level you're saying nobody and not reaching for the ranks and on the other level you're saying be you right you are discovering the richness and of of your beauty just as you are yeah not striving to become and do more and get rid more, 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 more. Did you notice a difference when you stopped practicing Kundalini yoga? Did you feel like the over, did you feel like you got overdeveloped in, in your practice? I first saw a difference when I stopped teacher's training every weekend. Okay. I'm young. I should be, you know, enjoying the beauty of this world. And I was every weekend cleaning the carpets preparing my yoga classes um helping cook and then staying extra and helping cleaning like 
that was a lot. Mm -hmm. So I first saw a difference in myself when I stopped doing that. And that was all for free, by the way. I mean, you're working every weekend at teacher training and that's all free? First, it was for exchange for my level twos. And then it was for free because I kind of wanted to go back when I started when I was 16 and I felt all this like transformation and joy when I was first giving everything. I felt truly that Seva was a gift. Sure. But at the end, like two years ago, one year ago, I was exhausted, but I wanted to feel that again. And I saw all these new people coming feel with that innocence and that joy. And I wanted that have to be, I wanted that back and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And then I would feel competition with my fellow um, trainers that were new. I kind of had to prove them that I was the best. Um, mm. But there was no competition. It was just me again with self-worth issues. That, but also a culture that's perpetuating that. Yes. And, yeah, I, and, and the, the, the uh, main teacher, the lead teacher saying, oh, Dion, you're always with your, me, 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 me. And um, you need to be more humble. Um, when I was in the ashram, um, it was a privilege to do seva. So again, she was indoctrinated and she and was gaslighting 101. Gaslighting like, yeah. Yes. So so you're the lead trader is telling you this, that you're not devoted enough. You're not humble enough. You're not enjoying your save enough. Now, this is after years and years of after dedication years. And, and all the things. Like, it's astounding to hear your story because there's so many elements of familiarity in it, in this landscape of 50 years of 3HO. It's just unbelievable. And then she would end up using my things. That's something that I've seen also with the older teachers is that they take advantage of like the fresh blood and they would end up using their material. So like, I remember I did this um, presentation on tantric numerology. I really like tantric numerology, but now I know it's all, it's all made up people. <laughs> and so anyways, I made this really cool presentation and then I end up seeing it in like Gurmayer Singh's trainer level one. And I'm like, wait, that's, that's mine. No. And same with this lady in San Diego. Like, can you pass me that music? Because of course she's not gonna go in Spotify and check out for new music. Like who brings all the new music? I do. Wow. So I, then I start feeling, I did not like how I felt that I had to feel protected of my, of my way of teaching because I don't know, like I felt why is it, I start doubting myself. Mm. Is it real? Am I really ego, ego, me, me, me? Or do I feel this person doesn't have the best interest in me? Is she just using me? No, no, no. Maybe I'm just have a very big ego, you know? Because so now you're hearing constantly too. And then that's what gets put back on you to stay in the Slavadar mode, no? Sla yeah, totally. And and I think she was getting advantage of her, like, of me, the, the lady. And maybe to the day if she hears this, she's still gonna think, no, it's you. But I think it was, it was, it was not her. It was just the way that she was indoctrinated as well, that she was perpetuating the whole cycle. Um, there is a slave of dark culture. They do take advantage of people's naiveness and innocence. Um, and nostalgia, you know, I think what I noticed and what I'm hearing in your picture so much or in, in the picture you've painted through your lived experience rather um, is in my little bits of like, you know, I didn't do much. I haven't been back to Solstice since I was 16, but I did go to the yoga festival for, for a couple of years and it really was painted mystically. They were like, they, anyone who talked about Yogi Bhajan, it was mystically, everything was so mystically, you know, it was like, and I could see the kind of goo goo gaga energy it was creating and kind of new yoga students that are like starving for truth, right? Starving for something real and having come from the Dharma and having seen things, beautiful things, and then a lot of beautiful things, I had a different context, obviously, and I spoke about it differently, but it wasn't until all this opened up that I suddenly realized, oh my God, it's not just me having perspective, this whole community, we've all been 
affected on a long-term basis that's historically traumatic because there's been such long-term secrecy and this kind of frontline public view, hidden world, private view. And we all were a part of not knowing that on some level. And she, um, every time she would talk about Yogi Bhajan, she would cry. And then that would make all the students feel like oh, she had a direct experience with the master, you know? And she kept story, telling the story how Yogi Bhajan would shout to her like terrible things, yet her heart felt like it was opening every time he would shout at her. That sounded always very contradicting to me. And that story always she told her after we saw the master's touch video where he was such an asshole and then we had to excuse his behavior. I never met that man, yet I was excusing his reactive anger to the students repeating what I've heard that it's just a culture barrier. It's just his language. It's just his personality. I remember in one of the master's touch, um, he said, oh, you should kill yourself because you're wearing makeup or something. And I remember all the students were like, this is wrong. And I was like, oh no, it, don't worry about it. It's just the way he talks, his mannerism from India. And that's very pervasive in teacher's training culture that people that we've never met him are excusing his behavior, repeating what we heard from our own teachers. And that's how we train the future generations. The batch, the next batch of teachers is a memorization of, of us. Yeah. And, and that makes it very subjective when you're in a position of power and you say something to a student, that's gonna keep in your brain and it's gonna really fuck with you. Like you are flirty and when you're flirty, you are not in attention. So that stayed with me. Am I really flirty? Like, is it wrong to be flirty? Yeah. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm flirty and I flirt with the universe and with my, <laughs> my, my kids and I flirt all the time. I love it. So I'm with you. Um, what's so beautiful for me to hear is like my personal self-reclamation journey was kind of coming to those realizations, like what you're talking about, but it was from never having experienced it and then saying it's like, oh, whoa, you're now talking about the opposite, in like the opposite journey. Like you went from being in the world into this community only to realize there's this huge culture of shame that even if it you didn't talk to Yogi Bhajan, these behaviors that he perpetuated and taught and did to his frontline students are rippling through our community still. And yeah. not just in the culture of relationships itself, but also being taught through yeah. the training systems and setting up a culture of abuse where my teacher yelled at me and it was amazing. And then therefore, when I yell at you, you can take it that way. And your, your story is spelling this out so... Obey serve love excel what's the first rule it's obey uh poke provoke confront elevate i'm just poking which means i care for you i'm your teacher mm. so on and so on and um so that's why in the beginning when i first found out it was 2020 i was still teaching i was finally getting paid it was like finally i'm getting paid 800 dollars a day that's great which is, you know, amazing. After fucking nine years, I'm finally getting paid. Wow. Um, but then I just couldn't. And I bowed down and I said, thank you, Kundalini. I just, it's not for me. I'm going back to Jimena. But now I feel anger. Like reading. Uh, was, that be was that when this, all this broke open and you read the Premka and stuff? Or was this before? No, it was after. It was Premka. Okay. It was feeling dried up. It was feeling abused by my late trainer, not abused, but like taking advantage of my youth. It was the beautiful medicine of love of my husband that I realized I need to be putting more focus in, in, in that relationship, in my family. It was all this accumulation and also my job, my full-time job. I'm a Waldorf teacher and I teach Spanish. Okay. And I think teaching Spanish has really linked with my roots. Yes. I'm not from India, I'm from Mexico. And if I am seeking for some spiritual wisdom, there's many in Mexico. Yes. 
and my abuelita can be the first one in telling me. I don't need freaking Yogi Bhajan or Guru Guru Santosh or whatever to tell me. My my own grandma can have many wisdom. Yeah. So that's something, um, so something very beautiful that I've seen in many of my friends that stepped out of 3HO is going back to our roots and to our origins. Mm. That's um, so beautiful. That's yeah. so beautiful. And, and when I confronted this lady that I worked for many years and I said, we're in a cult, she got very triggered. She doesn't believe we were in a cult and I don't blame her. She's been there for over 50 years. She sent her three kids to India, like... I, it's okay if she doesn't want to see it, but for me, I was in a cult, and and it was beautiful in the beginning, and I got a lot of things. I would not be here today without it. But it definitely gets to a point where it sucks. It dries you up, as I said, mm. and it stops your development. And I've seen that this whole ego thing, where you have to dissolve your ego. Ego is you're not your amigo, whatever. I think maybe it's the opposite where perhaps the salvation is being so intimate with your ego that you, you see the light in there. Mm -hmm. And I've been through the last, you know, since March diving into who am I um, yeah. with all the good and the bad and, and kind of restarting where I left off when I was 16. <laughs> Full circle moments. Yes. And, and reconnecting to your own awareness of your health and your body, you know, and realizing, wow, yes. how much of a toll these years have actually oh taken God. on the disconnect of your body. Yes. And I see that all the people that served so many years at solstices, Anand, and all these people that put their health at risk, you're not in your body. When you're running around serving Satsimran or serving whoever, you're not in your body. In Kundalini Yoga, you're not in your body. And drinking yogi tea with a lot of honey is not good for you. And and doing, you know, the banana diet, that's terrible. I did it like every fucking year. Or the melon diet. Oh my goodness gracious. And, mm -hmm. and so now that I'm not super young anymore. I'm 34 and I'm trying to have a family. I've come to realize that my hormones are out of whack. And after many years of unexplained infertility, a doctor told me you have PCOS and a lack of sleep um, makes, it's horrible for PCOS. Mm. Um, sugar is terrible for PCOS because I have insulin resistance. Stress is terrible. And believe me, when you are running the cabin and then you stay two weeks extra to run Kalsa Youth Camp, it's so stressful. Like you're in charge of all these kids. Surinam, bless his heart, but he's checked out. He just plays a guitar beautifully and you know he's great. My experience of him was great. I know he has really other stories. Um, um, teachers training every weekend, besides setting the space, also teaching and creating and grading, it really, really sucked my health. I'm not saying 3HO causes so-and-so, no. But in my case, that I bent myself backwards to please all these people, because I'm a people pleaser, it really hurt me hormonally mm. and and I had to learn that the wrong way so wow my my whole advice is you know people uh, don't think that you are the most important person and that um you can be replaced in an instant so don't take yourself so seriously and uh you know focus on your body like we always talk about the second chakra but what does that really mean the third chakra, oh yeah, Navikriya, whatever. All these like romantic uh, explanations about what meditation does and what about this Kriya does, we just repeating it, yet there's no real embodiment or experience of it. It has really taken me, like, it's such a different approach than Kundalini to become intimate with my womb and with my hormones. Um, and the first thing is to slow down. And you cannot slow down when you're trying to keep up. <laughs> Ooh, so well said. Thank you. You got tingles. Yeah. 
So thank you for sharing my story. Um, I was very nervous, but I hope at least for something. Thank you for telling your story and sharing your story. It is astounding to me the levels that you've traveled outward and the landscape that you've painted for us today. And I know if the listeners are hearing and were raised in 3HO and anything like me, they're seeing a picture painted that is one that is familiar to a lot of us, either that we witnessed, experienced ourselves or, or people we love have experienced. And for this to be still going on in this day and age, um, through the perpetuated teacher trainings really on some level it doesn't blow my mind but on another level it does and I'm sitting there just like wow wow yeah and you know perhaps in the United States it's going to stop sooner but I know in Mexico uh, in southern uh, Latin America they worship Yogi Bhajan there's no information available for them about, you mean the AOB report or any of these things that have come out in the story. So it's like full bore. They don't even, they're just going on as if nothing has happened and nobody's nothing speaking has happened. And the few people that I've talked, there's, they, they think I'm, I've gone all off the off wheel because I married someone off um, 3H. When I first told my, my teacher that I was marrying Scott, I invited her to my, so Babaji's wife, Babaji died, and then his wife is still here. Okay. And I said, I want you to come to my wedding. Please be part of it. She was like, why are you marrying him? Like, I think you're just um, conforming because you're scared you're never going to get someone else. I, all these things that really make me question, like, am I doing the right decision? Like, am I, am I just conforming? Am I just scared that I'm going to be alone? But no, marrying Scott was the best freaking decision. Ugh. Mary and yeah, he's amazing. But um you're amazing. Can... You let that in. I let that in. Yes, you did. And those are some hard walls that you formed. Yeah. And, and really good points that you formed around why you weren't letting this pure love in, right? Yeah. And and sometimes I get triggered, like, what were you doing working late? And and he's so understanding and FaceTime me like here, look, I'm here in my desk by myself. Um, and so I'm very thankful that he understands that I've been traumatized. I was, I lived in another life. So okay. thankful for Scott for that. But so my prayer is that Mexico and other countries can come to understand the depth of manipulation of fraud and abuse that 3HO was founded on um because they're still get blown away again there's this implicit racism where they think by having an american teacher is better than having a mexican teacher mm. um so i don't know how to pass all this information to mexico but someone has to yeah well i appreciate you saying that here i, I feel like um it's happening to the latin america and mexico it's happening through europe in general we know that the machine of just carry on and teach as if everything is okay. We know that that's happening. And hopefully by having a platform where more stories are available, we can break that or pierce the veil so that more students are getting um, direct information about the, uh, the shadow that obviously doesn't just used to exist, but it's still being perpetuated. And to my understanding, a lot of the abusive tendencies um, of, of certain teachers are still being perpetuated too. And, and it's kind of like replica, like replica formulas of um, predatory behavior that are still being taught through the teacher trainings. 100% agree. Well, I so value and appreciate your voice here and your willingness to speak out. There's many, many levels of things you spoke to from the infidelity to the inside outside experience, to teacher training, to India, to being a yoga student that kind of like becomes mystified and then, and then bringing it back to your own body and your own health and receiving love and what that really means. And 
to chase it and then to to know where we can block it when it's right there in front of us and and how come and you know leading it back to like deep level of, like even your willingness to say that's my self esteem and I know you're going to keep doing work to uncover more of what that is like why was I attracted to that what is it that was drawing me there so I I just can't say enough how courageous it is to share at this stage of your becoming. Thank you. And that reminds me, I feel like I was studying psychology. That's what I went for. And I remember I was still married and my father-in-law back then said, why study psychology? Like you have Kundalini yoga, like you don't need psychology. And that's also a narrative that we need to change that Kundalini yoga, it's not therapy. It's absolutely not therapy. So you do you find your coach, your therapist. For me, it has been books. Um, Belonging by T- Tokopa Turner has been a great book. A Woman That Runs With the Wolves has been an amazing book. And again, that was my first spiritual teacher when I was 16. So I'm going back to to that first um, draw that I had towards books. Towards your own wild, towards your own knowing, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and there it was. It reminds me of the book, The Alchemist. Like there it was inside you the whole time, right? Back. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. Um, I want to share your song and we can close out today's. Um, it was just, wow, a wealth of sharing today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for allowing us to hold you here. Thank you for sharing with us and, and let us know about this song. Yeah, so I chose this song. Uh, I just love how uh, melancholic it is. And I really like how when you're so wrapped up in busyness that um, you're looking for nothingness and then nothing arrives and then you're so busy to notice um, the simplicity, the simplicity of, of, of nothing. Um, so we don't have to be um, anyone else. We can just be ourselves. Love that. All right, here we go. Um, this is... Savannah scatters And the seabird sings So why should we fear What travel brings What were we hoping To get out of this Some kind of moment Terry Bliss I waited for something And something died So I waited for nothing And nothing arrived It's our dearest ally It's our closest friend It's our darkest blackout It's our final end My dear sweet nothing Let's start anew From here on in It's just me and you waited for something and something died so I waited for nothing and nothing arrived well I guess it's over I guess it's begun it's a loser's table We've already won It's a funny battle It's a constant game I 
guess I was busy when nothing came. I guess I was busy. Jimena, thank you really. Thank you for giving us your time and your energy and sharing your vulnerability here. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your strength. Bye. <laughs>